Hey guys, Professor Davis here, and we are now going to look at part two of the nervous system diseases and disorders. All right, so this section, we're going to start with vascular disorders. This is going to be where blood supply to the brain or to the nervous system is hindered somehow. And so one of the main causes of this is what we call cerebrovascular accidents or CVAs. The more common name for this is a stroke. This is due to poor blood supply to the brain itself. And so there could be a blockage that's occurring or there could be a hemorrhage where the blood vessel is like leaking out. So there are kind of three types that we're going to discuss here. The first one is a cerebral thrombus. So when we look at a thrombus, this is a clot and it's a clot that develops in the actual vessels in the brain. And so because of this, the symptoms a lot of times will come on gradually when we talk about a cerebral thrombus. On the other hand, you can have a cerebral embolism. This is where there's some sort of clot or plaque or something that got dislodged and it traveled through the blood vessels and then blocked the blood vessel. This is going to be where there's sudden symptoms that come into play. The last one is a cerebral hemorrhage. In this particular case, this is where the blood vessel ruptures. And when it ruptures, it, you're technically bleeding out right there. And the part on the other side of the rupture is not getting any blood supply. This is normally due to like a weakened area, area in the blood vessel. And we call that an aneurysm. Now, when we talk about a stroke or CVA, wherever the damage occurs, where the blood is not getting to the cells, the cells can start to die in the brain. This ultimately causes a lot of those symptoms. And we do see that if you end up having the stroke or the issue on the left side of the brain, it tends to affect the right side of the body. And if you have it on the right side of the brain, it affects the left side of the body. And this has to do with the fact that these connections of the nerves in your body do a crossing over at different points. And so those opposite sides of the brain control opposite sides of the body. So if you take a look here, the first two types of strokes, whether it was a thrombus or an embolism, are similar to this first group that are called the ischemic strokes, where there's actual blockage that's occurring and anything on the other side is not receiving the blood supply. It's kind of like a dam has been built and the blood can't get to the other side. Whereas with the hemorrhagic stroke, you can see that there is actually a bleed that takes place. Again, on the other side of that bleed, they're not getting the oxygen and all that they need, but it is due to a ruptured blood vessel. Now, a lot of times when we talk about strokes, the main kind of treatment for this is going to be a streptokinase, which is an enzyme that breaks down clots. Well, this is great for an ischemic stroke, not so great for hemorrhagic stroke, because in a hemorrhagic stroke, you actually want this to clot up so it'll stop bleeding. If you give them streptokinase, it will not. So let's talk a little bit about the symptoms of the CVA. Now, when we talk about symptoms of CVA or stroke, they can be very detrimental and, dis and they can cause disability to happen in the patient, okay, if they are progressed enough. There are numerous symptoms depending on the area of the brain that gets affected. So we could see things like sudden loss of consciousness, confusion by the patient, poor coordination, especially on that opposite side of the body. We could also see uh, dysphasia, which is going to be where they have a difficulty talking. They could also have dysphagia, which is where they have difficulty swallowing. They could also have hemiparesis, which is that weakness or paralysis on one side of the body. Now to diagnose a CVA or a stroke, we would do a physical examination. We would do a neurological exam as part of that physical examination, an EEG. They may even do a CT scan in order to determine what type of stroke is taking place. Is it ischemic or hemorrhagic or an MRI? Now treatment, if it is an ischemic stroke, we would use an anticoagulant. We might also use hypertensive medications if blood, high blood pressure is the culprit of causing the stroke. And then, of course, rehabilitation programs are going to be helpful with PT, OT, and even speech to help the patient hopefully either regain what they have lost or be able to cope and make strides in their life skills improvements based on what they've lost. Now, risk factors here are going to be smoking. Okay, smokers are at a higher risk, high fat diet, obesity, and lack of exercise. 
Now, surgical prevention treatment could be done, especially if we notice that there is a limited amount of blood heading up to the brain, and this is a carotid endarectomy where they go and clean out those blood vessels specifically in the neck, getting rid of those plaques and potential debris so they don't dislodge and get lodged in the brain itself. Now there is something that's known as a transient ischemic stroke. This is known as a TIA. This is what we call mini strokes. And when I say mini there, it's M-I-N-I. -I, so it means small or little. This is due to insufficient blood supply to the brain, but it's not complete loss of blood supply like we saw in the CVA or the stroke. So the symptoms here tend to only last for a few minutes or two for an hour. This is normally, guys, a warning sign of something greater, a bigger CVA happening, a bigger stroke happening. So these do need to be taken seriously, even though the symptoms like weakness, dizziness, slurred speech, and loss of consciousness do tend to go away pretty quickly with these, it does need to be checked out by a medical professional. And this could be diagnosed using an angiogram, taking a look at those blood vessels in the brain. The best way of treatment here though is to clean those out by doing surgery to improve blood flow. This could be where they use a balloon type thing, it could be where they put a stent in, something in order to help open up those blood vessels so that they deliver oxygen and blood better. The next group we want to talk about are the functional disorders. When we talk about functional disorders, these are going to include a number of things like degenerative disc disease. We'll talk a little bit about headaches and Parkinson's. So here, degenerative disc disease is where there's a gener degeneration or a wearing away of the intervertebral discs. So your vertebrae are stacked on top of each other and in between each, you've got a set of cartilage. This is gonna be where there's a wearing down of all of this and this allows the vertebrae to bump or rub against each other where it's bone on bone. This also causes what we call a spinal stenosis where the space where the nerves come out of the spinal cord is hindered or kind of like kinked in a sense and it can cause some major issues, um, especially pain wise. Symptoms of course are gonna be difficulty walking because the nerves communicating with those muscles are being hindered. They can have radiating pain in their back and down one or both of their legs. And one issue with this is the pain is a lot of times known as, is known as intractable, meaning that it's difficult to stop or control the pain. So it's really painful, but it's hard to control with like medications and things like that. Diagnosis is gonna be through x-ray, a maleogram of again, looking at the muscle, CT scan, or an MRI. Treatment is going to be rest. We want to rest their back and their legs. Um, they may need to wear a back brace. There could be some painkillers involved and maybe even some muscle relaxants if the muscle is being cramped up. Um, Anti-inflammatories may be utilized. Um, exercise to help ease the pain, and this could be through physical therapy, and then surgery might need to be done. And that's to help relieve that pressure, especially with what we call that stenosis that could take place. The next we wanna look at is headaches. Headaches is one of the most common disorders found in humans. Usually it's a symptom of another disease. And so a lot of times you'll get a headache because of something else like high blood pressure, or you get a headache from sinus infections or things like that. But it could be a disorder of itself. It's not very often, but it could be. Disorders that typically have headaches as a type of symptom would include sinitis. So you end up getting inflammation in your sinus cavities. Uh, meningitis, where there's gonna be that pain in the meninges, which we talked about, encephalitis, both of them are due to types of infections. Hypertension or high blood pressure can cause headaches. If you're anemic, not having enough red blood cells or hemoglobin, it could cause headaches. Constipation could even cause headaches. Premenstrual tension, especially when we talk about that premenstrual time right before period starts in a woman, it can increase their chances of headaches and even tumors could be a problem. So headaches, they're caused by two, one of two mechanisms. The first mechanism is gonna be tension on the facial, neck, or scalp muscles. If there's tension present there, it's gonna potentially cause a headache. The other is vascular changes in the arterial size of the vessels inside the head. So if we're not getting enough blood to the area into the brain, it can potentially cause headaches to occur. Now, one thing to note about this, guys, is that the brain tissue itself doesn't have any pain receptors, and so the pain you feel that comes along with a headache is, is due to the meninges or the other tissues like your brain case, the bone, your sinuses, things like that that are around the brain tissue. Now, contributing factors that can contribute to headaches, of course, are stress, toxic fumes. If you're smelling certain fumes, that can obviously cause headaches to develop, noise levels, 
lack of sleep, and alcohol consumption. Headaches may be acute, meaning they come on very quickly and then go away pretty quickly, or they could be chronic where they hang around for long periods of time or you end up dealing with a headache for a very long period of time. Pain may be mild, okay, to the fact that you don't really notice it too much, but it can also become unbearable. And when they become unbearable, unbearable kind of like migraines, they can actually also incapacitate the person, meaning that that person cannot function properly. Pain may be constant. Some people may describe it as a pressure, a throbbing, a stabbing, or an intermittent where it kind of comes and goes. Again, there are different types of headaches. So if we take a look at some of these types, we have tension headaches. Tension headaches tend to build up due to stress and strain. And so a lot of times it's going to be pulling in the muscles of the neck and all. And a lot of times the pain is on the occipital bone back here in the back of the head. The next ones are cluster headaches. Cluster headaches are unique because they actually develop when you're asleep. And so this is odd because you should be more relaxed when you're asleep, but cluster headaches start to flare up at that point. They can last for maybe a short period of time for a couple, maybe an hour or so, and then they go away, but then they may come back several times throughout the night. They could be triggered by things like stress or trauma. Emotional trauma especially can cause these types of headaches. And like I said, they are odd because they do develop at night when you are asleep. A lot of the pain is also going to be found in like the nose and the base of the eye area. It'll be more in this area that they tend to have more pain. We also see that you can end up getting really bad headaches following a lumbar puncture. We talked about lumbar puncture as one of the ways to diagnose certain disorders or problems. What can happen here is when that puncture takes place, if the patient doesn't remain laying flat for a period of time, some of that cerebral spinal fluid will leak out, which will cause the individual to have a very excruciating headache. And so most of the time after a lumbar puncture, the patient needs to lay flat for a couple of hours, two to three hours before they try to get up in order to help avoid that headache. The last type are the migraines. Um, migraines are one of those that can be debilitating. Migraines can be set off by a number of different things. Some people who have migraines actually have triggers that if they eat chocolate or if they have music too loud or different things that can trigger migraines to occur. Some individuals have a migraine where they see an aurora before where there's like an indication, like they'll see spots, they'll see squigglies with their eyes, things like that, that cause them to know that the migraine is coming. Other times, other people will just have where the migraine just hits. These are very painful. They're very severe. So migraines are two times more common in females than they are in males. So no matter what the headache is, diagnosis could be a history and a physical exam. We may need to do an x-ray, an EEG, MRI, or CT scan to discover what the underlying cause of the headache is. Now treatment, there could be some lifestyle changes that can help with treatments of headaches. This could be improving your diet, avoiding triggers, sleeping properly, and doing exercise. Um, analgesics or painkillers could also be used to treat headaches as well as bed rest. Muscle massages might help, especially if we're talking about tension headache that's found especially in the shoulders and the back. Muscle relaxants may also need to be utilized, warm baths, and even doing something that we call biofeedback. So biofeedback is a mechanism used a lot of times to help calm down, meditation, kind of like visualization, using really relaxing music, scents, different things like that to help lower stress and will ultimately help help with the headaches. The next one we want to talk about is going to be epilepsy. Now epilepsy is a chronic disease of the brain. It is characterized by intermittent episodes of abnormal electrical activity. So it's almost like the brain activity like goes haywire, it short circuits. Kind of like if your computer just like starts opening all kinds of stuff and then it just shuts down. That's kind of like what happens with epilepsy. The brain kind of gets overstimulated until it finally has to shut down and restart in a sense. The cause of epilepsy, guys, is really unknown. We don't really know what the underlying cause it for really most people are for epilepsy. But the symptoms that come along with epilepsy are going to be seizures. Seizures could also include convulsions. Okay, they don't have to include convulsions, but they could. Some common types of seizures are going to be things like a peat mall seizure. Peat mall seizures are also known as absence seizures. This is where the patient is kind of like just absent, staring into space, not blinking, just not there. And this is really common in kids. And we do see that they tend to grow out of it most of the time, but they're just absent and they don't even realize that it's happening and they don't really last that long. 
On the other hand, grand mal seizures are the big ones. They're the ones that come along with what we actually call the convulsions. This is going to be where the individual has that seizure. When they come to after the seizure is over, they're very tired. They may have even lost their bowel control, whether it's the urinary or the actual bowels with the intestines. They've lost that control. They may have even had an issue with breathing during the time of the seizure. And so these are the ones that are kind of a lot more scary when we think of a seizure. One that is more progressive than even the grand mal is the status epileptus. This one is going to be where they have like a grand mal seizure and they never regain consciousness completely before they go into another one. And then they don't regain consciousness again and then they go into another seizure. This one is very life threatening. This is a really big deal. And this is because we didn't actually see a recovery period for the patient. And this is going to be too where the, there's lack of oxygen that happens to the brain, which ultimately causes brain death to occur. Diagnosis is through an EEG, a CT scan. They may even do a cerebral angiogram to double check the blood vessels into the brain and certain blood tests. Now, treatment is going to be anti-convulsive medications. They would do a close monitoring during this time when they first prescribe these in order to adjust them accordingly. And this kind of monitoring will continue the whole time they're on these anti-convulsant medications. After an actual seizure takes place, a lot of patients go into what we call a postictal state. And this is going to be where they're coming out of the seizure and there's like a recovery period that's happening. They're now becoming conscious, but they're very tired and drained because it's almost like they ran a marathon when they've had the convulsions and all that kind of stuff. And their brain is then rebooting and restarting. With this, guys, is there are some precautions that need to be taken if you come upon an individual having a seizure or epileptic attack, or if you are having to deal with that in a hospital setting. The big thing is, is if they are having a seizure, you want to loosen any tight clothes, especially those around the neck and the chest in order to help them be able to breathe a little bit better. We would also want to protect the individual, not restrain them, but kind of like maybe cradle their head and that kind of thing so they're not hitting it on some hard surface or anything like that. That, but we don't want to stop them or try to hold them down while they're convulsing because then it could cause more injuries to them. You never force anything into somebody's mouth even while they're having a seizure because they could bite down on it, break it off, cause them to actually choke in that process. So nothing needs to go into their mouth at all to try to stop them and say, oh, they'll swallow their tongue. No, there is a higher risk of there being a bigger problem if you try to put something in their mouth. And so just let it be with that. If they're in the hospital and they are a seizure risk, they have epilepsy like they've been diagnosed, always make sure the bed rails are up before you leave the patient. So if they have a seizure when you're not present right there, the bed rails can help protect them without for hopefully prevent them from falling out of the bed. All right, the next one we want to talk about is Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy affects the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven, and it leads to a unilateral paralysis. Now, unilateral means one side. So one side is affected. You can see there's a droopiness that's occurring due to those muscles being paralyzed. This affects individuals ages 20 to 60 years of age. We do see that symptoms are going to be the drooping weakness of the eye and the mouth. This could cause them to have an inability to close the affected eye because it does paralyze the eyelid as well. Drooling of saliva since they can't control the mouth, unable to whistle or smile, and distorted facial appearance. You can actually see the drooping that's taking place. With Bell's palsy, we have a diagnosis and hit of by history and symptoms that are taking place by the individual. Treatment is going to be analgesics and anti-inflammatories because a lot of times there's inflammation around the nerve that's kind of compressing it and causing this issue. Most cases do actually resolve on their own anywhere between two to eight weeks, but physical therapy may need to be done to help regain some strength and control of those muscles of the face. The next one we want to look at is Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a slow, progressive brain um, degeneration that does occur. The cause is unknown, but it may be related to decrease of brain neurotransmitter dopamine. We do see there is a relationship that a lot of individuals who deal with Parkinson's have low levels of dopamine present. So what are some of the symptoms of Parkinson's? We see that there's a rigidity and immobility of the hands. 
They have very slow speech pattern because if they try to speak any faster, they get all tongue tied because this is a lot of times due to that lack of muscle control that's present. They will have a lot of times a peel rolling motion in their fingers where they'll kind of rub their fingers back and forth kind of unconsciously through that process. They'll have an expressionless, faceless appearance. So they lose the control of the face a lot of times and don't show a lot of expression. Abnormal bent forward posture. You can see in this picture where they're kind of bent forward. And this is again due to not being able to utilize muscles properly. They may have short, fast running steps that also come with a shuffle, especially if there's a change in the terrain or if they need to take a step or anything like that, there's going to be a shuffling that takes place, which then also puts them at a higher risk of falling and causing other injuries to occur. Another thing you'll notice a lot of times with individuals with Parkinson's is they'll have tremors where they have a shakiness that is occurring in their muscles. Symptomatic treatment is the main thing for Parkinson's because there is no cure. So dopamine replacement is one of the biggest things that they could utilize as well as physical therapy and psychological therapy. Um, it does take a toll on them mentally when they're dealing with a disease like Parkinson's. The next group we want to talk about are the dementias. And there's a number of types of dementia we're going to discuss. And so dementias, guys, are a loss of mental ability due to loss of neurons or brain cells. And once those are lost, guys, they don't grow back. We don't have them anymore. There are different types of dementia. First group is called the senile or old age dementia. Alzheimer's falls into this group. It's the most common type of senile dementia. Senile and Alzheimer's dementia tends to be like used synonymously, like interchangeably. They're pretty much this, the same thing by most people's standards, but they're really not. Alzheimer's is a lot more progressed than just forgetting things because of old age. We also see that there's vascular dementia, head trauma dementia, and substance-induced dementia. So let's talk about Alzheimer's first. When we look at Alzheimer's, it's a form of senile dementia, and it usually affects individuals age 60 and older. And technically, it's really kind of 70 and older that we really start to see a lot of the symptoms, at least the later stage symptoms. So what are some early symptoms that we see with Alzheimer's disease? Well, first of all, they'll have short-term memory loss. So they'll have that short-term issue where they can't remember what they were just doing, things like that. They have an inability to concentrate and a slight change in their personality may start to occur. As the symptoms of the disease start to progress, because there's no cure for Alzheimer's, it will progress. A lot of the medications that they're trying to give for Alzheimer's are palliative, just to kind of help the quality of life for the individual. And they do try to slow down the, prog the progress of dementia, but they haven't found a lot of drugs to actually do that right now. And so the progressive symptoms are gonna be things like diminished communication skills, meaningless words, they do not make any sense when they're talking to you, inability to form sentences anymore, increased forgetfulness, irritability, and agitation can occur. Now, diagnosis of Alzheimer's is only really positive at autopsy. An autopsy can determine that there is definitely Alzheimer's. However, we do see that there are some scans that can be done, CT-wise, MRI, that can show these little plaque areas that are forming like clusters that form in the brain. And it can also show that the brain is starting to atrophy or shrink. Initial diagnosis may be made by ruling out other brain diseases. So what's the main treatment for Alzheimer's? Well, it's supportive because there's no cure for Alzheimer's. We can't reverse it. We can't really slow it down. We need to support the patient as they go through this. And we also need to support the patient's family because this takes a huge toll on the family, especially if they're trying to take care of an individual at home that has Alzheimer's. A lot of the actual treatment is going to focus on the safety of the individual, uh, maintaining proper nutrition for as long as possible, hydration, and personal hygiene because they forget how to take care of themselves. Emotional support for family and caregivers is critical for patients with Alzheimer's. Being able to make sure that their families are 
supported during this time where they're pretty much mentally losing their loved one. It's not actually the same person that's there anymore. Um, my grandmother had Alzheimer's and it was a really long drawn out process. She lived with it for about 12 years and it just got worse and worse and worse till eventually she forgot how to swallow and she ended up forgetting even to breathe like she's supposed to. And so it causes a big degeneration on the brain itself. The next one we want to look at is vascular dementia. This is a atrophy and death of the brain cells, but it's due to decreased blood flow. This is a lot of times due to an arthritic plaque. There's a plaque buildup that takes place um, due to high, a lot of times high lipid diets and cholesterol and things like that. But it, what it does is it starts clogging up the vessel and it gets more and more clogged to where less and less blood gets through. And this is a common thing that does occur as we age. So symptoms of vascular dementia are changes in memory, personality, and judgment. The patient may also have increased irritability, depression, sleeplessness, and lack of personal hygiene. Diagnosis is going to be a history and a physical exam. And we do see that we want to, with whatever treatment method we choose, we want to try to increase blood flow to the brain. And this could go back to the same kind of treatments that we saw with some of the CVA and stroke. We could clean out any of those plaques, especially in the carotids, to try to help prevent dislodging pieces and things like that as those plaques develop. The next type of dementia is known as head trauma dementia. This is death of brain cells due to actual trauma that's taken place. Symptoms here are decrease in mental intellect and cognitive function that does occur, loss of the ability to reason, remember, or show appropriate emotions may happen, and even changes in personality might occur. Diagnosis here is a history, cranial x-ray, CT scan, or MRI. And the treatment is we need to correct the damage if possible. If this is due to a trauma that there's increased swelling on the brain or something like that due to a car accident or whatever, we need to get that part taken under control so that we can then in turn hopefully help the dementia. Therapy and rehabilitation may also need to happen. So one of this one, because this is due to trauma to the brain itself, prevention is kind of key. It's often easy to prevent these by using proper protective equipment when we're like in the car wearing our seatbelts. Um, if we're riding bikes or skateboarding or anything where there could be a fall where the head could be hit, wearing helmets like we're supposed to. At work, if there's certain risk factors for head trauma, wearing the proper protective equipment. That is one of the big ways to prevent head trauma dementia. The next one is substance-induced dementia. This is where the brain cell death is occurring due to like a drug toxicity or certain toxins that are being taken in by the individual. Some toxic substances that can cause this type of dementia include alcohol, so excessive alcohol, certain kinds of drugs like cocaine and heroin. We also see some chemicals like lead and mercury. Even breathing in paint fumes and paint thinner can also trigger this as well as really concentrated insecticides. Now symptoms with this type of dementia are mental impairment and decreased cognitive ability. The main way that we want to treat this is to remove the toxin and the toxic substance. If we remove that, sometimes if the damage is not too far done on those cells, we can then regain a lot of that function, a lot of that memory before it becomes more of a permanent issue. But the big thing is to try to get rid of those toxins. The last thing I'm going to talk about in this particular part two is going to be sleep disorders. Now guys, when we talk about sleep disorders, not getting enough sleep can be very det detrimental to your health. So even just depriving yourself of, of sleep for 24 hours can ultimately start to affect your personality. We can see personality changes if you haven't slept in 24 hours. We also see that it can mess with your muscle coordination and it can test your mental capabilities where you don't problem solve as well because you're sleep deprived. Now, insomnia is the most common form of sleep disorder that's out there and it is characterized or defined as the inability to fall or stay asleep. Now, there's a lot of things that can cause you to have insomnia. These include things like stress. If you're in a lot of pain, you have some sort of fear that you're not dealing with properly. Depression. If you drink caffeine too late, it could cause insomnia. Alcohol, nicotine, and bronchodilators because those are what we consider stimulants, which then ultimately stimulate your brain and keep you awake. 
Now the treatment for insomnia, oh sorry, symptoms are going to be where you can be having a lot of fatigue and irritability due to that lack of sleep. So treatment is identifying and removing the cause. If it's stress, let's deal with our stress. If it's caffeine, cut the caffeine out. So we've got to try to identify what our underlying cause of the insomnia is and address it. The last one on here is sleep apnea. This is characterized by periods of breathlessness where the individual kind of like holds or stops breathing. Now the cause, these, this is more common in men and some causes are obesity, hypertension, so high blood pressure, airway obstruction, alcohol ingestion, or cigarette smoking. So these are higher risk factors that can be causes of sleep apnea. Now, what are the symptoms of sleep apnea? Well, they include daytime sleepiness because you're not sleeping well at night. Your brain's not actually resting like it should. We also see there's extreme snoring that takes place, changes in personality, depression, and even impotence can be a problem. Now, there are three types of sleep apnea. The first type is called obstructive sleep apnea, and this is where your airway is obstructed. A lot of times it's due to like a broken nose, the nasal area is not being able to breathe in, so they're more of a mouth breather, which causes a problem. The second is more the central type of sleep apnea, and this is where there's an issue in the brain. There's a special area in the medulla that is the respiratory control center. There's a problem there when we talk about the central apnea. And then the third is called mixed apnea, and it's a combination of both. It's a brain issue as well as an obstructed airway. So diagnosis is monitoring the affected individual during sleep. Okay, so we're going to watch for apnea and also low blood oxygen levels. And this is where we talk about them doing a sleep study. If you've ever had to go have a sleep study done, this is one of the things they're testing for, as well as potentially insomnia in some cases. Treatment for sleep apnea is based on the cause. If it's due to being overweight, we need to lose weight. If it's due to hypertension, let's take care of your blood pressure. If it's an obstruction, let's do a surgical correction of that nasal cavity so it opens up so you can breathe better. So it's based on the cause. We also see that they may need to actually have oxygen while they're sleeping. This is called a CPAP machine where they put it on. It's really loud, but it gives them oxygen throughout the night, making sure that they are continuing to breathe. There could also be medications given to stimulate breathing. This is a medication. Cafcit is a medication of this. It's like pure caffeine. And if you get it on your skin, it absorbs super quickly and gives you a really bad headache. But Cafcit is one of those things that uh, medications that they give premature babies who have a lot of sleep apnea. My daughter had to be on this whenever she was first born because she was displaying some sleep apnea issues. And Cafcit helps keep it stimulated. It also, though, keeps the baby stimulated to where they're irritable and they don't sleep as well either. So it's kind of a catch 22 with some of that. So preventions of sleep apnea, most cases can be prevented by maintaining a healthy body weight. We also see avoiding alcohol, not smoking, and even avoiding certain environmental smoke could be helpful. Okay, so this is talking about sleep apnea. All right, so this finishes up part two of the nervous system disorders and diseases. There will be a part three, and part three will focus in on tumors as well as trauma. It will also look at spinal injuries because it's a type of trauma as well as brain injuries. And then it'll talk a little bit about some of the rare diseases like Huntington's, ALS, some things like that. So if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Thank <laughs> you.